By now, I'm guessing that you have read the title of the God Talk and are wondering what on earth is she going to say today? Well, there is that separation of church and state thing, but it's not being enforced. It's actually against the law for me as an ordained clergy who is part of a church, a 501c3 church, to advise you on your voting. And yet, I know there are many pastors who do just that these days. But Jesus was an activist, and you must realize several things in his life story were greatly influenced by the politicians and the governments of his day. Today, I'm addressing how we, as followers of this person who exemplified unconditional love, work all this out. Some of you read that sermon title and heard this. Is Jesus a Republican or Democrat? And wondered which of those choices I would answer in the God Talk today. But the inflection to be heard when reading this question is this. Is Jesus a Republican or a Democrat? And of course the answer is no, of course not. Now, Amazon.com currently sells shirts with graphics telling us who Jesus would vote for. And there are various styles, colors, and names that tell us who Jesus is voting for. First of all, I want to clear the air about using Jesus as a part of our political landscape during this election season. It's just not right. I think my grandmother meant well when she taught me that saying, oh my God, is using the Lord's name incorrectly. But as I grew in my spiritual understandings, I know now that exploiting the name of Jesus to gain favor among humans who may agree with me or cause discomfort in those who don't is using the Lord's name in vain in a big way. And it's wrong, simply wrong. In today's climate, this is what led to Christian nationalism, a movement which has co-opted the words Jesus and Christian to prove that their political views are ordained by Christ himself and therefore correct. So back to our question, is Jesus a Democrat or a Republican? No, and we shouldn't waste our time even pondering what Jesus would do in our country on November 5th, and here's why. We already know what Jesus would do. I'm reading to you from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said to Jesus, we know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. The Jesus that we see in this passage was not going to be pinned down to choose an answer any more than I was going to answer our first question with one of the choices. The Herodians and the Pharisees had joined forces to try to trap Jesus into an answer that would show his bias of either siding with the Romans, which would have been horrible for a Jew to have done, or to be seen as an adversary against the Romans. Either way, he was going to lose. Before they asked the question, they had buttered him up. They acknowledged that Jesus was a man of integrity, and they said that they knew he taught the truth. They may not have believed either of these things, but remember, they were toying with him. 
and then they ask him to give his opinion. Tell us then, what is your opinion, they said. Most people I know are more than eager to share their opinion, so when actually solicited, who can resist? But remember, they're trying to trip him up. They want to put Jesus in a vulnerable place where he could say the wrong thing and they would have a gotcha feeling. So Jesus, aware of what they're doing, calls them hypocrites and calls them out on trying to trap him. And they are hypocrites by feigning something that they are not. Jesus calls for a coin, the one that would be used to pay the tax, a denarius. A denarius was a silver coin with the image of Caesar on the front. Let's remember that the Torah, the sacred scriptures of the Jews, first five books of what you and I might call the Old Testament, forbid Jews to have or use graven images. The Romans had given special permission for Jews to make their own coins from gold. But today's story involves a silver coin with the image of Caesar on it. Again, this might show the hypocrisy of the people dealing with Jesus. No Jew among them should have had this coin on his person. A bit of history here. The face on the coin is Caesar Augustus, who was the ruler who decreed that all citizens had to be registered. You remember the Christmas story. But at this point in Jesus' life, Caesar Tiberius, Augustus's adopted son, was the ruler now. The coins, however, still had the image of Augustus on it. Now, because Caesar's own face was on the coin, Jesus took a look at it and easily told the others to give back to Caesar what clearly belonged to him. And then he followed it with, and give to God what is God's. This is the part that amazed and stumped the questioners. Jesus was telling them, yes, pay the tax, but bigger than that, more importantly than that, paramount to any other answer I can give you is to give God what is God's. And everything is God's. Everything. Let that sink in for a moment. In modern vernacular, sure, pay the tax. That's what we do here in this government. The government's made by humans the government that draws lines in the sand, the government that treats groups of people differently, Romans, Jews, Pharisees, the government that instills fear into people. Sure, pay the tax, but beyond that, remember there is a higher calling, a higher purpose, a higher way to live. Yes, a higher force than Caesar, a higher force than a Democrat or Republican. And that's who I'm going to serve. That is my governing body, the law of God, the law that tells me to love my neighbor as myself. So pay the tax, but that's not the biggest issue on the table in our lives here, fellas. We get so distracted by the noise of the world that sometimes we need to be rudely reminded of what is important, reminded by a horrible fire in our community where our neighbors need shelter, reminded by empty shelves at Wegmans when there's poverty and hunger in our town. Hatred, name calling, mudslinging, all pull us away from a higher way of thought and action in our community, a higher way of being, personal integrity. Sure, pay the tax. Do what you think is best in the community. Help out at the food shelf. Work at the polls. Build and maintain a community garden. All important ways to serve the community and beyond. But while doing all these important works, let's surround ourselves with the wholeness and beauty of Eden while building the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So, is Jesus a Republican or Democrat? No. Even though you can find YouTubes that will tell you otherwise, Jesus is above all of that. Jesus didn't know Republican and Democrat. In his day and in ours, Jesus wants us to love our neighbors, 
the ones with yard signs, the ones who talk about amendments, the ones who are pro-life, the ones who speak in the state house supporting women's rights, the ones who run the food shelf and the ones who get their meals there, the people crossing our southern border and the guards who patrol it. We are to love them all. It doesn't mean we agree with them. It doesn't mean we're not angry. But the bottom line is there is a higher calling than someone's flag on a Bible, the size of a rally crowd, someone's face on a billboard, or Caesar's picture on a coin. Let's stay focused. Amen.